of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, my hope and my prayer is that we can all uh, be followers of him as he was of Christ in his day and be able to uh, stand up for what is right. Amen. Stand up for what is right. Fight for righteous, for justice. Amen. For all people. Amen. And, and do what Jesus would do. Amen. And so we thank God uh, for his life and his legacy that continues to this day. Well, today we begin or we continue our sermon series on reset. Somebody say reset. 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 And beginning the new year, uh, a lot of you want a reset. You want to start all over again. And we talked about last Sunday how some of us have been through some stuff where we wish there was an actual reset button, a do-over where we can go back and do it again, right? And so we realize there is no actual reset button, but we serve a God of second chances. We serve a God that provides reset, amen? And so maybe 2022 did not so go so as planned for you. You had some bumps in the road. You had some regrets. But understand that the God that we serve is a God that if you come to him, amen, with a sincere heart, he will forgive everything. He will not remember it, and he will give you a reset button. You can restart again. You can start over and understand that God's plans are not your plans. His ways are not your ways. He has bigger and better plans than what you can create for yourself. Amen? And so as we follow Jesus, as we, as we seek him, those plans become more and more clear as we seek his direction. And so we talked last week about how God's desire for 2023 is for all of us who serve him is to live an extraordinary life. He wants us to have an extraordinary life uh, for you and your family. And we discussed the definition of what is an extraordinary life. And we found that the word extraordinary means very unusual, remarkable, above and beyond what is expected. That is what extraordinary means. And I don't know about you, but for me, that describes who God is. Amen? And if that's the kind of God we serve, then we should dare ask God for big things. Amen? Because if it's something that you can do, if it's something that you can figure out with your own intellect, it's too small. But if it's something that's beyond your intellect, beyond your doing, then it has to be God. Amen? And so he wants remarkable things, unusual, above and beyond what is expected. And so the title for last uh, Sunday was How to Get from Here to There. And we talked about uh, Joshua chapter 1 when God calls Joshua, Moses had died, and we broke that down and we explained it, how uh, he led the people into the promised land. And we talked about that there are three things that we need to consistently do for 2023 to be an extraordinary year. And it will require, number one, believe fearlessly. Number two, live intentionally. And number three, show up in faith. Amen. Those are three things that God requires of us. Amen. If we're going to experience an extraordinary year, believe fearlessly, live intentionally, show up in faith. And so... Today we continue in our uh, sermon series in part two. And I want to ask you uh, a few questions uh, before we move forward. Do you ever feel like you're in a spiritual rut? Do you ever wonder why you haven't grown spiritually? These are loaded questions, by the way. Are you covering the same ground in your Christian walk? Do you ever wonder why though you are learning about Jesus, you are not living like him? This is for grown folks right here. This is for people who can be honest with themselves. And there's nothing wrong with it. These are the kinds of questions that will make you uncomfortable, will make you think, 
look in the mirror, and if you can really honestly answer them, you will have a breakthrough. Do you find yourself asking, man, I've been a Christian for years, but I don't feel any closer to Christ today than I did years ago. Well, you know, the Bible talks about life transformation. And we hear others tell their stories of how God changed them. Back in the day, we used to have testimony nights. And a lot of people used to share their testimony. It's powerful when you share your story. There's nothing bigger and better than you sharing your story. Nobody can take that from you. It's your personal story between you and God. And we hear these testimonies and these stories of people, how God changed them. We're like, man. You know, and for many of us, we desperately want to change. I, I believe that every person in this room desperately, honestly wants to change. There's no questioning that. But we see so little of it personally. Why is that? You ever ask yourself that question? Why is it that I don't see it? And perhaps part of the problem is some faulty assumption that we create some myths that we've come to believe about being transformed. And so here are just three that I want to leave with you. There are three myths, three faulty assumptions regarding life change. Number one, life change happens at salvation. Life change happens at salvation. That, that's, that's a myth. You want to write that down. There's this comedian, a Russian comedian, uh, by the name of Yakov Smirnov. And he was being interviewed, and he says that, he says that when he first came to the United States from Russia, uh, he wasn't prepared for the incredible uh, variety of instant products available in American stores. He says that on, on his first shopping trip, he saw powdered milk. And he was like, wow, powdered milk. You just add water. And bam, you got milk. Then he said he saw powdered orange juice. And he said, wow, you just add water and bam, you got orange juice. And then he says, I saw baby powder. And he thought to himself, he thought to himself, what a country. <laughs> what a country. You see, one of the most basic assumptions about life, about life change, is that it happens instantly at salvation. And that's just not true. People come to Christ and think that by being a Christian, their habits, attitudes, and character will change immediately or instantly. Since Christ alters a person's eternal destiny at salvation, so immediately life changes is, is not only assumed, it's expected. But that is not the case. I've seen people come to the altar crying, receiving Christ, because again, it is, some, many times, it is an emotional experience, and people raise their hands and they're crying, but that is not the evidence of salvation. It does happen instantly, but just because that, because I've seen people come to the altar and then come out the parking lot cursing people out because they cut them off. And so, when you look at that, you're saying, but I thought you were at the altar receiving Christ. Well, yeah, salvation occurred. That's immediate. But life change doesn't happen the way salvation happens. So that's, for, uh, that's a, a, a false assumption, number one. And, and then number two is life change continues naturally over time. Life change continues naturally, keyword naturally, over time. Well, here the assumption is that being a Christian will translate automatically into becoming a Christian. Therefore, a five-year-old Christian will have five years' worth of spiritual maturity. A 10-year-old Christian will have 10 years of spiritual maturity. And so on and so on. The assumption is that faith cannot help but grow with time, and it is time alone that is required. That, my friends, is not true. When you look at someone, you can generally 
have an idea of how old they are in person. Not on social media because some of y'all be abusing those filters. Abusing. You know who you are and we're going to have an altar call here soon. Abusing filters. It ain't right. Because when people see you in prayer, they're like, stop lying. You're not the person I met on social media. <laughs> Woo. So, but generally, you can look at a person and kind of tell, right? Uh, sure, you know, some, some of the ladies, you know, they, they wear makeup and, and they look younger or older for their age. But, but you can tell an approximation of their natural or physical age. You can't do this with someone's spirituality. You can't look at a person and determine their spiritual age. You can only judge someone's faith age by the way they act. That's why sometimes it's confusing for people. You meet somebody. How long have you been serving the Lord? Oh, I've been serving the Lord 30 years. 30 years? That's weird. Because your faith age just doesn't match up with the years that you're confessing that you've been serving the Lord, it's just, it's weird. And so, like when you're in a group and you're speaking faith things about things to come, like if you're surrounded by people who are visionaries and believe God for crazy things, you could tell somebody's faith age in those conversations because you're going to have those like, no, oh, I don't think that's possible. I don't think that's possible. See, their faith age is, is very bad. Because somebody who, 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 who has faith age is up there, they understand there's nothing impossible for God. So they're not surprised when God does something, a miracle. That's why people who are in a certain faith age, they're not running after conferences, after the evangelist, after the prophet. That's why you see us, and, and it's not that we're trying to, uh, please, uh, diminish if you will the office of an evangelist or a pro no not at all it's just that we know our place we know our place and we don't have to run after conferences prophets evangelists I, I, if, if I'm going to an evangelistic crusade I want to bring somebody who doesn't know Jesus that's my faith age I'm going but I'm going because I want to accompany someone who doesn't know Jesus this might be a good experience for them, not so much for me. I'm saved. Does that make sense? I don't run after prophets because if God has a word for me, he would bring that prophet to me. And he would give me the word. I don't run after prophets. I don't run after signs and wonders because I'm at a certain faith age. And I do not, again, please do not misunderstand what I am saying. If you do that, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. What I'm saying is make sure that you strive to reach a faith age where you no longer have to do that, where you're feeding yourself, studying God's word, and surrounding yourself with people at your faith age. Does that make sense? Okay. And then uh, number three, life change is best accomplished alone. That is an assumption. Life change is accomplished alone. So, in other words, a personal relationship with Christ has become actually synonymous, believe it or not, with a private relationship with Christ. And that's not true. Just get along with God, have a personal devotion. Uh, private retreats and one's life will automatically change. The fact is that we need each other. I need you. You need me. Because we can't tell someone's spiritual age because we don't grow spiritually the same way we grow naturally. And because we can't grow by willpower, we need help from others. The strong need the weak. The older need the younger to teach the younger. We need community. That is what the church is designed for. Community. Relationship. It is the way God 
designed the church to function. And listen, church, this morning, I will submit to you. I will submit to you that the greatest work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life is not power. It's not rema. It's not theology for theology's sake. It's not signs or wonders. It's not an emotional experience or feeling. Uh Uh-uh. It's the humility of Christ. It's the humility of Christ. That's the most powerful transformation of the Christian faith. Not the acts of Jesus, but his heart. Not the acts of Jesus, but his heart. Miracles, signs, healings, speaking in tongues, prophetic, all those, that's all good, but I want his heart. At the end of the day, I want his heart. Because if I have his heart, I have it all. I want to be more like the likeness of Christ. That should be our goal as human beings, as a church, as believers of Jesus. Make me more like you. So then, if these are all assumptions and myths, then what is the right formula for life change? I'm glad you asked. I like this because you guys are engaged, and that's what we want. We want to be engaged. Well, believe it or not, there is actually a better way that exists. It's a correct way, actually. And so today my title will be God's part and my part in changing me. God's part and my part in changing me. So what is the better way? Well, let's go to the Apostle Paul. He outlines it right there in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. And he said, So then, my dear friends, just as you always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, Watch this. Sometimes we read the Bible too fast and we miss key words. It says, enabling you both. What he said? Both. That means that there's two things, just in case. Just in case you missed it. Both means there's two things. You got to read slow. For God is, for it is God who is working you, enabling you both, number one, to desire, and then watch the second thing, and to work out who to work out what is it yours is it your purpose is it yours whose is it that's what we get it wrong to work out his good purpose so basically Paul explains that the Christian life is not a series of ups and downs it is a process of ins and outs It's a process of ins and outs. In other words, God works in us while we work out. It is a partnership involving God, the individual believer, teachers, and fellow believers. So it's a team effort here. There's a lot of variables going on here. It is a process where God works in, we work out, teachers work with, and believers work together. It can be stated like this. Life change begins with God, is about training, not trying, requires teaching, and is is a team effort. That's what it is. So where does life change begin? I'm glad you asked. Life change, write this down, life change begins with God. Life change begins with God. Philippians 2.13. For it is who? God. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. So God has a role in the life change process. We partner With God, God is always at work in us. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, 
Verse 10. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. So God works in us before he can work through us. Let me say that again. God works in us before he can work through us. Why is that? Well, it's because if you go forward ahead trying to get involved in certain types of ministry and God hasn't worked in your character, let me tell you something about what people call the altar or the stage or the limelight. Let me tell you something about this, this being up here. This will expose you. Be careful what you desire. What you see up here, people see this like glamour. There is no glamour and glitz about this. Let me tell you, every preacher who really truly fears God, when they come up here, we are trembling. I've been doing this for over 20 plus years, and every single time I'm in front of people to bring this word, I get knots in my stomach. The day that I lose that, I'm in trouble. Because there has to be a reverence to this. There has to be a fear. Not a fear of being scared, but a fear of reverence and the responsibility and the weight that comes with delivering this word. And so this will expose you if you're not living right. Not perfect, but holy. And so God works in us before he can work through us. Because we're trying to do ministry, but our character is all over the place. We have none. And gifts and talents will open doors, but it is character that will take you there. Character. Doing what you said you were going to do. Being what you said you were going to be. Character. Things that we take for granted that we think have nothing to do with character. No, that's character. Little white lies, character, they build up after a while. So God works in us before he can work through us. And our English word energy comes from the word translated from energia in verse 13. It is God's divine energy at work in us and through us. So when we give our life to Christ, our eternal destiny is altered. Is altered. There is a radical reorientation of priorities. There is a new life purpose. And there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see that is a true conversion. Something truly happens. And begins to take place. In someone's heart. Someone knows when they have an encounter with Jesus. You know something happened. You know there was something supernatural that took place. It's radical. You've never experienced that before. It starts opening up your appetite for more. Here's another way of looking at it. The event of salvation is best seen as the beginning of a journey as God begins his work in us that will lead to life change. Just as there was a process that led up to our conversion so is there a process that moves us to life change? Something happened that got you to receive Jesus. Do you remember that? For those who follow Jesus. There was a moment where you said, here I am, Lord. I'm tired of running. I can't fight no more. You've been calling me. Because the Holy Spirit begins to prompt you. The Holy Spirit begins to put that desire in you. Something, there's a seed. Somebody planted a seed somewhere, somehow, there's a seed that was planted. That's why church is so important to share your faith. That's why it's so important to share your story. Every opportunity you get, do you know that God gives you opportunities every single day? Every time you meet somebody, that's God bringing you an opportunity to say something to them about Jesus. Just a seed. Just a seed. Hey, listen, I don't know you, but I just want to tell you that Jesus, he loves you, and he has a purpose for your life. 
That's all. That's a seed. That's all you got to tell them. That's a seed. Then here comes the Holy Spirit. Begins to water that seed. Begins to, to touch that person's heart. And that person could be sitting in their desk at home, driving, thinking about you. Man, Jesus loves me. He has a purpose for me. Jesus loves me. He has a purpose for me. Jesus loves me. He has a purpose for me. And they can't stop thinking about it because now the Holy Spirit is at work. That's why it's so important for you, the church, to do something as simple as that. You don't got to preach a whole sermon. You don't got to have a theological degree. Simply, hey, listen, I don't know you. I just want to share with you that Jesus loves you and he has a purpose for you. That's it. That's how simple it is. You've sown the seed. Because all of us, somehow, we receive that seed. And that seed, the Holy Spirit used to bring us to the feet of Jesus. Salvation happened quickly. But it was a process to get you there. And there's going to be a long process to get you to life change. So I want to, I want to encourage somebody. Stop beating yourself up because you keep making the same mistake. Stop beating yourself up because you're struggling with a sin area. Listen, God still loves you. You're saved, but you're struggling with an area that you've been doing. It took years to get there. It's going to take some time. I mean, God, listen, I don't want to diminish God's power. God has the power to help you stop it right then. He can do that. He has done it with many people. He did it with Paul. He smacked him upside his neck so hard he fell off his horse, then got blind, then he heard the voice of Jesus. Yo, bro, why are you persecuting me? Oh, man, I wasn't persecuting, I was persecuting those people. Man, I was doing it for you. Dude, I didn't ask you to do that for me. Those are my peeps. You're hurting them, you're killing them. My bad, bro. What you want me to do now? And he stood blind for a little while. And then the life change started happening. Paul, the one who wrote one third of the Holy Bible, the New Testament. Paul, one of the most geniuses, Pharisees of all time, had to submit to other men to learn. What makes you think that you can't submit to other men to learn. If Paul had to spend years learning, let me re retract that. Paul had to spend years unlearning and then to learn something new about the grace of Jesus. What makes you think it's going to happen so quick for you? Life change takes a process. And in this process, there are certain things that are required. And so God begins his work in us, but this is what happened. He uses three tools in the process. Three tools God uses to work in us, and I want you to write this down. Number one, God uses the Bible to bring about life change. God uses the Bible to bring about life change. Through his word, he teaches us how to live. There was a story I heard a missionary share years ago about... Uh, uh, it was a, a, a converted cannibal. If you don't know what's a cannibal, it's, it's a tribe in some jungles that they eat humans. They would eat humans. They would take them, kill them, and put them in this big pot and boil them, and they would eat. That's a cannibal. And so the missionary is sharing uh, that there was a, a cannibal, and he's reading the Bible, and there was a, a uh, anthropologist that happened to be Working in the area, he sees the cannibal by a rock next to a big pot. He was cooking something. And the anthropologist asks the cannibal, what are you reading there? He says, oh, I'm reading the Bible. And the anthropologist laughed at him and said, bro, Western, the Western culture, that we stopped reading that book a long time ago. It's just, it's just filled with lies and nonsense. Don't read that. Don't bother. Don't waste your time reading that book. It's, it's nothing. And the guy, the cannibal, looked at him up and down.
And he said, sir, if it wasn't for this book, you'd be in that pot right now. (laughs) Apparently, the word of God changed his life and his appetite. (laughs) You see, if you're serious about changing your life, you're going to have to live according to the Bible. There's no shortcuts. You're either studying that Bible and you're applying it and you're living it or you're not. There's no in between. We have to study the word. Once you study the word the correct way and you allow people to help you understand how to study the word and how to interpret scripture correctly, what's going to happen is you're going to see life change in your life. You will need to read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it, and more importantly, Apply it. And that's where many of us fall short is we don't apply it. We know it. Some of y'all can memorize scriptures like crazy, but you don't apply it. And it is in the applying, and, and, and you apply it in the most crucial moments of your life. When all hell is breaking loose, that's when God is like, okay, let me see if you're applying all this Bible study. Because you show all these quoting scriptures on social media. I'm going to allow this to come into your life. Let me see where you stand with all this quoting. You will be tested. Your faith will stand trial. Your faith will be tested. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. It's got to go through a test. You just can't talk nonsense and quote scripture. Let me see it. I hear you, but I don't see it. And there's nothing more confusing than a person who talks good but shows a poor example. No, I don't want to preach. I'm teaching today. (laughs) After yesterday's party, I don't think I could move much. I don't know, what was I thinking? Trying to do a backspin. Some of y'all wrong. They didn't even stop me. They're like, go ahead, pastor, go ahead. It's messed up. James 1.22 says this. Be doers of the word. Doers of the word. And not just hearers. Be doers. Let's do this thing. Let's do this thing. Let's apply it. Say, God, change. God, what is it I got to do? I want to live your word. I want to experience this thing. That other people profess that they've experienced. I'm seeing it in them. I want to see it in me. Well, you got to do it. You got to do this thing. The fact is that God gave us his word to teach us. The Bible can teach me about life and how to live life better than I did before I met Jesus. All the instructions are in the Bible. Pick it up. Spend time in and read it. Number two, God uses the Holy Spirit to change us. God uses the Holy Spirit to change us. The Holy Spirit provides the power, the conviction, and the direction for life change. Did you know that? He does. The Holy Spirit acts like an internal warning system when we begin to make wrong steps and he also acts like an applauding crowd when we take the right steps toward becoming like Jesus. Yes, he does. He gives you warnings. Whenever you're about to sin, you feel it. You feel it. You know God gave emotions for something, right? And sometimes, you know, that's why Jesus wants to be in the center of your heart Because our emotions sometimes go out of whack. So Jesus wants to be in the center of your emotions to keep them in check. So when you you yield to the Holy Spirit, what you're doing is you're yielding your emotions to the Holy Spirit so that when your emotions try to get all out of control, the Holy Spirit is in the center. He can calm you down. When you're about to punch somebody in the neck, the Holy Spirit is like, no, no, no. You're not the same thug. You're not the same thug. Right? And so you start feeling, when you're about to, you feel it. There's something, and that something is the Holy Spirit. When you're about to do something you're not supposed to do, the Holy Spirit triggers you. And now it is up to you to yield Or ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit. And I will tell you something. 
When you choose to ignore the warning and the voice of the Holy Spirit, you're in some serious, serious danger zone. Let me tell you that right now. When you intentionally ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit, you need to check yourself because you are in some really dangerous ground. That is not a good thing to ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit. So God's number one purpose in life is to make us just like Jesus Christ. That is the number one purpose of God, to make us all like Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make the child of God more like the Son of God. That's too much to repeat. <laughs> but because I love you, I will go ahead. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make the child of God more like the Son of God. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to make the child of God more like the Son of God. Number three, God uses circumstances to change us. Hmm. That's the part a lot of y'all don't like. Like, man, I don't mind reading the Bible, and I don't mind the Holy Spirit changing me. But can we remove the circumstances? Mm, no. No, we can't. <laughs> They've already decided up in heaven that they're going to use circumstances to change us. And we're not talking about good circumstances. We're talking about some real bad circumstances. The circumstances are the problems, the pressures, the heartaches, the difficulties, the stress of life. Suffering gets our attention. Suffering gets our attention. Pain gets our attention. I will never forget 9-11. I worked just a few blocks away, me and my brother. We saw the whole thing, ran for our lives when the buildings collapsed. It was a scary Scary situation. But I remember the following week, Sunday, boy, every single church had revival. The Catholics had revival. Methodists had revival. Presbyterians had revival. Pentecostals had revival. Even the non denominational had revival. Everybody had revival. Everybody ran to church. See, sometimes. We turn to God when our foundations are being shaken only to find out that it is God doing the shaking. Sometimes we turn to God when our foundations are being shaken. God, what's going on? It's God doing the shaking. God is in the details. God is not taken by surprise. God is not led by emotions or feelings. He is God. He knows all things. He is in the details. And whenever you put anything before God, he is the kind of God that's so jealous. He said, oh, okay. I done try to warn you with my spirit, with my word. That looks like it ain't working. Okay. So like a loving father, I'm going to have to give you a little pop out. Just a little pop out. So he starts shaking your foundations enough to get your attention where you come running to him. And when you do, he's like, ah, oh, my child, there you go. Now I got your attention. And he does that because he loves us. And he's a jealous God. And nothing comes before God. He wants you, all of you. All of you, he wants you. And so, he uses life circumstances to change us. C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure, but shouts to us in our pain. I couldn't agree with C.S. Lewis any more than that. See, the painful circumstances, whether we bring them on ourselves, or other people cause them, or the devil incites them, are used by God to help us grow in likeness, to his son, Jesus Christ. Now, there are five things we should understand about life change. Number one, life change is about training, not trying. Write that down. 
Life change is about training, not trying. Notice that Paul doesn't say work for your salvation. Paul does not say work for your salvation. He said to, because to work for something means to earn it, to deserve it, to merit it. And the Bible clearly teaches that salvation is not something we have to work for. It is a free gift of God's grace. So we all understand that, correct? So Paul is not implying that we devise our own plan of salvation or that we work into a right relationship with God by our own efforts. The verb here, the verb work out, carries the meaning of work to full completion, such as working out a problem in mathematics. In Paul's day, it actually was used for working a mind, working a mind in that culture. That is getting out of the mind the valuable or possible, whatever it was that they discovered within the mind. But the word was also used for working a field so as to get the greatest harvest possible. Today, we use the word to describe to, describe to physical exercise as to get into the best possible shape. So when Paul says, work out your salvation, he is talking about a spiritual workout or a spiritual training. So life change is not about trying, it's about training. Life change is not about you trying to be more like Christ. You're in the training process to become more like Christ. Because trying implies that you're doing it with your own strength. Trying implies you're, you're doing it with your own intellect. And the things of God are not natural, they're spiritual. And so people that don't have the spirit of God do not understand the things of God. And so I'm not trying, I'm in training. Training to become more like Christ. So merely trying to experience life change can never bring about life change. I can try very hard to bench press 300 pounds. I can barely make 100. Don't judge. I can try my very best to, to, to press 300 pounds, but that isn't what will enable me to do it. No. So how can I bench press 300 pounds? I will only be able to bench press 300 pounds by training to bench press 300 pounds. So if my goal is to be able to bench press 300 pounds, I'm going to start with 50 pounds. Then move, and now, oh, wow, I'm up to 100 pounds. Oh, snap. I'm training my body for a goal. And so what happens is the more I submit myself, come on, to a training, because you got to submit yourself. It's not going to come naturally. You just can't stand there and say, God, here I am, just do it. <laughs> do it, Lord. Lord, I'm waiting on your time. I'm being obedient to your word on your time. Here I am, Lord, just waiting. That, that's not how it works. You have to do your part. And God does his part in changing you. He does the impossible. You do the possible. So I'm training at 50 pounds. I'm going gradually. The problem is some of you come, you come to Christ and you see somebody already at level 10 and you want to get to level 10. It doesn't work that way. There are levels to this. And you got to do it the right way. If not, you're going to get hurt. You ever try to bench press something heavy that we do? Yo, hell man, I need somebody. Spot me, yo, yo, spot me. You ever see those videos? People killing themselves because they're trying to impress people. If you live your life trying to impress people, you are never going to make it. Because your identity is in them, not Christ. When your identity is in Christ and you're striving to be like Christ, you don't care what people say or think about you. You don't care. It, 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 it just doesn't, it, it doesn't even affect you one bit. The criticisms and the judgments 
that you hear about you. Because my identity is in Christ and I'm going at the pace that I'm provided by the Holy Spirit. We all have a pace. Stick to your pace and stick to your lane. Number two, life change requires teaching. Teaching. Change rarely happens in a vacuum, church. Often we need the advice and wisdom of others. We do. For Christian growth, God's plan includes the counsel and guidance of the teachers. Paul was a teacher to the Philippians. He had modeled for them and instructed them in the Christ-like life. He was the teacher. They were the students. He was faithful to his calling. They were obedient to his instructions. You see the partnership here? You see, so optimal growth occurs when we fall under someone who knows something we don't or has experience in an area we don't and is willing to share this knowledge with us. That's what it is. Optimal growth. That is the role of the teacher and the learner. Openness to the thought and insight and direction of a teacher is a sure sign of maturity. If you can submit to a teacher, if you can submit to your cell group and have a willingness to learn, you are going to start experiencing life change. I remember John Wooden the great basketball coach, he said, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. I love that. It's what you learn after you know it all that counts. See, one of the greatest tragedies of people uh, of God, both biblically and historically, has been their instance on not following their appointed, installed, and ordained leaders. That's why you have today, I've never seen it like I see it today. Back in my day, Back in the north, I mean, it is a phenomenon. I mean, people are just church hoppers. Just hopping. One church to another. Eh, the worship, eh, not my cup of tea. Eh, don't get fed. I'm sorry, how long you been serving the Lord? 33 years. 33 years? And you're still depending on a spoon to feed you. 33 years? Your faith age is still down here? 33 years? Bouncing, bouncing. Just bouncing. If any, listen, if, if you live your life looking for excuses, you're going to find them. You're going to find them. But if you live your life to honor God, oh, you don't got time for excuses. When you live your life honoring God, worshiping God, say, you know, with the mentality, you know what? We don't got it all as a church. We don't do everything as other churches do. We don't have the money or the budget like other churches. But who cares, pastor? We're going to honor God with what we got, where we at. We don't have to have it all. But pastor, what we have is honor. Honor. me bouncing it you know yes I understand there's some churches that are not healthy church and I get it abusive church not healthy I get it but I, I can say this with all confidence not because I'm the pastor but I can truly say that I'm submitted to authority I have overseers that been around done that that are known individuals that are respected in the Christian community some to be theologians that I'm submitted by, that hold me accountable. And this church is under the Assemblies of God, one of the largest Christian organizations in the world, very respected and reputable, although they've had their issues like any other organization. But I can say confidently that we teach the Bible here, the truth of the Bible. We have sound doctrine. We are a spirit-filled church where we give freedom to the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We give room and space for you to grow. There's always opportunities for you to grow. 
And so I can confidently say that this is a healthy church. A church that honors Jesus, that teaches Jesus, and that helps people try to become like Jesus the best that we can. But you can't keep jumping from church to church because you're never going to grow your faith age. Whenever you see a therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is it there for? No pun intended. <laughs> therefore is actually a hinge word. God expressed his therefore in verse 9, but the therefore in verse 12 is our therefore. And it makes sense, doesn't it? See, understanding what God has done for us, right? that was in verse 9, if, you, if, if, if we read that, it, it talks about what God did for us. Understanding what he did for us, the death and resurrection of Jesus. We, therefore, now this is our part, engage in spiritual growth and vitality and gratitude for that sacrifice. He did his, therefore. He died on the cross. He died. He resurrected. That was his, therefore. Now, our, therefore, we acknowledge that, and we engage in spiritual growth. And so we engage in spiritual growth in relationship with other believers. So just as we have a relationship with Christ, we are to have a relationship with like-minded believers who are pursuing this intimate relationship with Christ, seeking to become more and more like him. It's important. The unity, the community, gathering together, soul groups. And I'm way past my time. But just let me give you these two very quickly without... Too much explained. Life change is highly relational. Life change is highly relational. Business people and athletes talk about the power of a team. In life, we all need support. And when we get it, it brings about the change we are desperate for. Spiritual growth was never, listen church, spiritual growth was never intended to be a solo event. It was always intended to be a team sport. Always. It's the way God designed it. In the context of relationships with other believers, we receive accountability. That's what a lot of people don't like. That's why you got to be careful when people say, oh, uh, I'm suffering church hurt. Really? Let's talk about your church hurt. Because a lot, well, a lot of people talk about church hurt is actually accountability. A pastor sat them down because a pastor saw some things that needed correction and a pastor did the right thing. And a pastor privately brought correction with love and wisdom biblically, and they got hurt and they left the church. That, my friends, is not spiritual abuse. That, my friends, is not church hurt. That, my friends, was a wise pastor. So be careful when you got people crying, church hurt. I think that's being abused. I've been church hurt. I've been church hurt. How long have you been serving the Lord now? Anyway. We got to start acting our faith age. Faith age. Everybody's accountable. You have to be held accountable. And the way you're held accountable is through people. Hold you accountable. Ask you the tough questions. If you don't want nobody getting your business, Christianity is not for you. Because in the early church, everybody was in everybody's business. There's no such thing as, you know, that's personal. No, it's not. I'm trying to hold you accountable, and you're running. Accountability is uncomfortable. Trust me, I know. I'm asked some really uncomfortable questions at times, but I have to submit because they have their best interests at heart. That's why soul groups are so critical to our spiritual growth and development. Life change happens best in the context of relationship, and last but not least, Five, life change is a partnership. God has a part, we have a part, teachers have a part, and fellow believers have a part. God works in, we work out, teachers work with, and the believers work together. Do you feel like you're in a spiritual rut? Do you wonder why you haven't grown spiritually? Are you covering the same ground in your Christian walk? Do you wonder why... Though you are learning about Jesus, you are not living like him? Are you saying to yourself, 
I've been a Christian for years, but I don't feel closer to him today than I did years ago. If you are struggling with spiritual growth and little life change is occurring, then where is the breakdown? Where is the breakdown? Are you in partnership with God? Are you allowing God to use his tools of Bible, the Holy Spirit and circumstances to mold you into the likeness of Christ? Are you in training? Are you engaged in a spiritual workout by employing spiritual disciplines? Are you submitting to teachers for instruction and guidance? Are you engaged with other believers to hold you accountable, challenge, encourage, and support your life change? These are all valid questions, necessary questions. Here's a solution. Pray and chart a course for your 2023. And then every day ask yourself these questions. What am I doing today that is moving me towards becoming more like Christ? Or what am I doing that I need to stop doing that is hindering me from becoming more like Christ? That's a question you have to ask yourself every single day. Here's another solution. Join the prayer and the fast that we're doing. Start the year with this book. I strongly recommend Amazon has it for real cheap. It's a great, there's other great books, but this book is really in particular on, on the subject of prayer. It's called E.M. Bounds. That's his name, the author's name. E.M. Bounds, B-O-U-N-D-S. E.M. Bounds on prayer is the name of the book. E.M. Bounds on prayer is a classic, awesome book on prayer. Attend Presence Nights this Tuesday. How many were there last Tuesday? Powerful. Learn to pray collectively. Learn to pray collectively. Alone, but there's a time collect. Presence night. Don't miss that one. If you missed last Tuesday, don't miss this Tuesday. I'm telling you. Sign up for a soul group after this service. Sign up for a soul group. And last but not least, read through the entire Bible. In 2023, you still have time. Download the U version app uh, if you don't have it already. And start reading the Bible. It'll even read it to you while you're driving. No excuses. And I will end with this like I ended last Sunday. James chapter 4, verse 8. Look at it in the, the screen from the voice. Come close to the one true God, and he will draw close to you. Wash your hands. You have dirtied them in sin. Cleanse your heart because your mind is split down the middle. Your love for God on one side and selfish pursuits on the other. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and your grace. Because once again, you remind us through your word that you love us, that you have a purpose for us. But that in order for us to walk out in that God-given purpose, there are requirements that you expect from us. There are some things that are hindering our walk with you. And so, Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit right now will bring conviction to anyone, Lord, who feels that they're away from you and that they cannot come close to you. And for those of you hearing the word repentance, sometimes it has a negative connotation to it. Let me just remind you that the word repentance simply means to change your mind. That's what it means. Change your mind. Change your mind about your current living situation. Change your mind about where you stand today. Change your mind about who you're serving. Change your mind. So with everybody's eyes closed, head bowed, I want to give someone an opportunity to respond to the gospel message of Jesus. The good news. To come and follow him. And so at the count of three. 
I'm going to ask you to lift your hands high enough for me to see it and then put it back down and we will have a prayer and that would be it and we'll give you further instructions. And so if you've received Jesus before, you don't have to do it a second time because once you give your life to Christ, the life change process begins. You don't have to continue to receive or accept Jesus over and over again the Holy Spirit begins to work in you from that first time and so I want to give those who have never done this this opportunity if you want to follow Jesus starting today and your, for your life to begin to change at the count of three just raise your hand high enough for me to see ready one two three are you here I see your hand God bless you you can put it down Anybody else? Anyone else that says, Pastor, moving forward, I want to follow Jesus. So let us pray for that one soul. And then I'll give instructions. Father, I thank you for the one soul, Lord, that made a decision, Lord, to follow you today. And so, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would begin the change process in that individual. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide that she, Lord, would have an appetite for your word, yes. a hunger for your, for, your, for your word, and a thirst for your presence. Yes. Father, I pray that you will cultivate that seed, protect that seed that's been planted in her heart today. Father, I ask you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give God a praise.